Hey everybody, this is the Sliders Review and it's Women's History Month and I'm here today to talk to you about Mistresses Season 1. So this show came out in 2013 on ABC. Basically, it is based off of an Australian um, television series of the same name and the characters with the same like personality traits and um, plots and stuff like that. And so, I've never seen the original. I really want to. I think I found it once on YouTube, but I forgot why I didn't watch it. I think I was busy. I need to go re, um, re, um, try to refine it and stuff uh, when I have more time. Because I'm very curious to see what the Australian version was like. But the reason why ABC made this, other than the fact that they just needed to show, is that they needed a desperate housewives filler. Desperate Housewives was one of the biggest shows on ABC lasting for eight seasons and it was a like fully female led show. It had males but it was a more of a female led show and so it captivated people of all like you know demographics and stuff and since then they've been trying to uh, replicate that but to no um, success. They tried with Pam M and they tried with GCB, but both those shows failed to find like an audience and got canceled after just one season. The closest Desperate Housewives filler they ever had was that of Pretty Little Liars. Only problem with that is that Pretty Little Liars was on their sister network and it was more targeted towards teens and young adults. They needed something for more older people and something with much more mature and bite to it. So they found the Australian show and just remade that. And whew, it worked out beautifully in their thing. Well, at least for the first two seasons, that is. <laughs> See, the first two seasons were filmed in America. But then to cut calls, they went to Canada in the last two seasons. And when they went to Canada, they lost their hugest star power, Alyssa Milano. See, Alyssa Milano was technically like not necessarily like it's, it's they're, they're, um, a group of women, they're co-leads, but she was like the main one with the show focused on. And so everybody knew who she was going in and a lot of people watched because of that reason and that reason alone and they wanted a Desperate Housewives filler. But when she left at the end of season two because she didn't want to move to Canada because she had just had a baby and she didn't want to move her entire family over to Canada, she left the show and was written out and never returned. Never even returned for this um, series finale and stuff. So they was desperate to find a new lead and they made the biggest mistake of trying to make the party girl of the show the more central focus character. That just did not work out very well and I've talked about that before. The party girl was just literally that, a party girl and she was the youngest out of all like you know the um, other group of women, but because she was playing Alyssa Milano's sister, they decided to make her the new lead. It just did not work out well. Plus, to fill in that spot of the fourth like mistress and everything, they started bringing in new characters each season. And the third season, they brought on, I forget the actress name. Ah, I forgot her name. But they brought her in, and her character was annoying when it matched with that of the new lead girl. Then in season four, they brought in Harry's sister and they tried to have conflict between her and the lead girl, Josh, and it just still did not work out in their favor. Plus the storylines were, yes, getting more juicier and they were more interesting and stuff, but they were also a bit too crazy with um, the Karen character. The Karen character is the biggest tragic character in the entirety of the series. And I don't know why, but even before season four had wrapped up, the actress who played Karen was done. Like she had left the show and she only had like an episode left and they didn't know they was getting renewed or not. 
So they just kind of kept making her character more and more trashier, more and more like unsympathetic in that times. And so it was just kind of like, it was just wasn't fun no more, you know? And that's what took all the fun out. And, but I still say this to this day, the first two seasons are the best. And it's weird when you look at these characters because all these characters are terrible women except for April and everything. April, for the most part, is the only real true innocent person. But they did try to trash her up a little bit towards the end of season one. But all these other women do such terrible things, but you still root for them because you just generally like their characters and stuff. And I've already talked about the first episode, go watch that. So I want to talk about the rest of the season. But like I said before, America tried to remake this before with another charm sister. Alyssa Milano was this charm sister, but then they tried to remake it for a lifetime. Lifetime shot a pilot in there thing and they shot it with Holly Marie Combs who is the other charm sister and the entire cast is completely different except for the April character which they brought that actress back Rochelle they brought her back for the other American remake so whoever was like making this show which is weird because it was two different networks. They had her in mind, which is cool, you know? And I don't know where this pilot is at. Rochelle does not know where this pilot is at. It's mostly in some type of archives and stuff, never to be seen by the public, but little snippets got loose on the internet. And it's just a very brief little scene. It's a very emotional scene. It has a different feel to it than that of what we got in the um, ABC one. Let's talk a little bit about the Lifetime Mistresses show. Um, it's only a five minute clip you can find about, I think, on, um, online. And basically, when it comes to a Lifetime one, Melissa Carter and Holly Marie Holmes are the one who created the show. And Holly also wrote the pilot and stuff that did not get picked up. It has a more warmer feel, a more dramatic feel, um, a more mature, classical, mature drama type show than the somewhat spicier one that we had on like, you know, ABC. Because like in the scene when April's talking about Paul, it's not really pulled down, way down, like a really dramatic, dramatic thing. Here, it feels like it's pulled down, like dramatic, dramatic and stuff. And ironically, Holly is playing somewhat of like the April character. She's talking about how she um, thinks she's seeing her dead husband and like how she has two kids and her sister's babysitting them and stuff like that. And this is different than the one from ABC because in the version where April played by Rochelle, she only has one kid and that's Lucy. And she doesn't start thinking she can see Paul until halfway into like the season towards the end. Now, what's interesting is that it's funny because Rochelle was in the Lifetime version, but she didn't play the April type character. That was Holly. Who exactly did she play? Not quite sure. See, here's the thing. I know for a fact that Holly played the April type character. And in the UK version, the April type character had two kids. And, you know, whatchamacallum, the April version in the American one did not have a sister. And so with the rest of the cast, it's interesting because this came out like, you know, that was 2009. So that was like, you know, over like, you know, a long time ago, <laughs> a real long time ago. And so while reading IMBD, I was able to, um, eight, not April, but able to find two boys on there that they look pretty young on their pictures. So they would have been a whole lot younger back then. And their character went by the same last name, um, Shadowfield. And so I'm assuming those are the two boys that, uh, or at least the two kids that Holly's talking about. 
and Holly played a character named Janie, and she does not have no last name. And so Rochelle, who went on to play April in the ABC version, she plays Ava. Who exactly is her counterpart from the ABC one? We have no idea. And then so you get Brooke Burns. And she played a character named Shannon. And once again, we have no idea who she's supposed to be based on. And so there's a woman named Sarah. Okay, the woman in, with the red hair in the picture. Oh, Brooke Burns is the one sitting down. And with the blonde hair. And so Sarah... Gli Whoa, how you say this? Glendon Dean. Um, she plays a person named Cecilia um, Barnes. And in the clip, she seems kind of like the fun party girl type, especially with her outfit. I'm guessing she's based off of Josh. Now, ironically, there's a fifth member in this picture. Which is funny because both the UK and the American version, the ABC one, does not have a fifth woman. But, like, um, this woman named Camille Sullivan plays Kate. So, I don't know who. She could probably be, like, an original character, probably, or something like that. And also, that dude, Corey, from the Glee show, he was in this and stuff. It, you know, like seriously, there is a pilot that was filmed and everything, but it's probably been shelved in the archives. It would have been so intriguing to watch it and stuff, just to compare the differences and stuff. The ABC one is very trashy. Think of a, a, a trashy um, reality show, but realistically in like a written, like scripted format and stuff. And you get this show. It's juicy, it's seductive, it's scandalous, and you always want it more. This show has never been released on DVD, which is quite a shame in everything. And I don't understand that. This was kind of like one of those mid-summer shows and everything. It's one of those replacement shows. But it quickly became like a huge fan favorite. And with 13 episodes, people always wanted more and stuff. So let's get into some character profiles and what did they do in this show that made them so scandalous and everything. I'm going to start with the ones whose storylines weren't really all that juicy and kind of a little bit dull. My bad. I keep saying the Australian version. I meant to say the British version. I keep getting this show messed up with Sisters, an Australian show that later had an American adaption. All right. First, let's start with Josh, who is played by Jess McCannon. And she is the younger sister of Savvy, and she works in real estate selling houses. Josh um, is, well, the most promiscuous one out of the entire group. She will sleep around with any man she sees just because she's just like sex crazy and everything. And it's even to the point of like sleeping with like a co-worker and stuff. And you always see her just like wearing the shortest skirts and dresses. And because she's a really, really tall, leggy woman and everything. And it's a really funny scene when she's in the elevator and there's a woman with her child. And the woman looks at her and is all like... Your skirt is too short for my child. And her reply is one of the greatest replies I've ever heard. Your child is too short for my skirt. <laughs> oh boy, I love it. And so her and Sabby get along pretty well until, you know, they don't. They always quarrel about like something because Joss is just not responsible and everything. And Savvy's the older sister who always had to hold things together. There's a really nice bonding episode that's filler, actually, when they try to make Savvy look like a good person because of all the bad stuff she did. Well, it turns out that one of the reasons why the girls are the way they are is because of their mom. Their mom is a floozy who would just go with any man possible. Even to the point that when they were younger, they was at the beach and the mom pretended to drown just so the lifeguard can come over and give her mouth to mouth and save her and stuff. 
So this is where they all get it from. And their mom also forgets their birthday. So Savvy literally had to like scrounge up whatever little babysitting money she had just to buy her sister a gift and say it was from her mom. She never knew that until I think, I don't know, she actually never knew that, but I think she, um, Savvy might have told her. And so it's even at the point where Josh loses her home and she has to live with Savvy in that of, um, what's his name? Er, I forget his name right fast. Um, Harry and stuff. And so like Josh is also the last one to always find out anything because she's kind of a bit of a blabbermouth and of course she knows Harry. And so when it comes to her and her story arc in this, other than her just sleeping around, is that she gets a brand new boss named Olivier and she hates him to death and those two are constantly like feuding with each other and he's like French and stuff like that. He thinks she's incompetent and she just doesn't like him and crap. And so like when trying to sell a house, this one lesbian couple, uh, one woman named Alex and Alex's girlfriend, Alice's girlfriend can tell that Alice is kind of attracted to that of Josh because she has that type, you know, she's blonde and stuff like that. And that's what she kind of likes. Anyways, when Alex confines in Josh about like, you know, um, things not working out between her and her girlfriend, Josh convinces her that hey, maybe you should just like dump her and stuff. Then um these two start to spark up like a friendship type bond that turns somewhat flirtatious when josh is like you know showering and everything and because i think what it was um alex got kicked out of her place because you know she broke up with her girlfriend and now she's staying with josh and so when Josh is like showering, here comes Alice just coming into the shower and not asking, by the way, didn't get no permission or like that. And just went in and started showering and started like filling up and making out with Josh. What's odd is that Josh was actually into it, which is weird because Josh is not a lesbian or bisexual in any kind of way. She is as straight as straight can be, but for whatever reason, she decides you know what, I'm gonna try this out, why not? This is because of the Australian version and stuff. And so, their relationship is kinda odd. It's a kinda relationship, kinda not. It's just them hanging out, being friends, and on occasion, they'll like do stuff together. And so, she tells her, you know, I'm not good with relationships, and you know, this isn't what I do, cause you know, Josh just sleeps around, and she's all like, you know, Plus, she just likes men and, you know, Alice like, okay, you know, whatever, stuff like that. But then you start to see Josh start to actually have somewhat of a feelings towards her and stuff. And it's kind of interesting. Ah, it's kind of like, okay, where is this going to go? But then you still see Josh, like, sleeping around. And I think they had an agreement that, you know, Josh can sleep with whoever she wants, but she has to, like, you know, let um, Alex know first, I think, or something like that. Or whenever they decide to be a true couple couple, I think Josh has to like lay off guys or something like that. I think what it was is that Alex thought that she could change Josh and their thing, but um, Josh and their thing won't be changed. And in fact, she keeps sleeping around with more men, even to the point of sleeping around with her boss, Olivier, when those two stop feuding with each other and start like doing it. And so what's worse is that Olivier just basically wanted to bang Josh before he goes back to like France and everything. And, but he promoted her to be the new head of the real estate office. And she decides, you know what? I'm good. And she quits and everything because she talks about how she hates her job. But she's really good at it and stuff. And so, of course... When she goes back to that of uh, Alex, Alex sees bite marks on her and realizes, yo, those didn't come from me. And she realizes that Josh had been stepping out in a course with that of men. And so this causes a huge fight between those two where they literally break up and everything. And Josh decides to repay her by giving her a house that she was going to sell. A really nice one. And that's it. They break up and 
we don't see Alex no more. In fact, I believe we don't see Alex again until a cameo in the third season because Josh got herself some um, trouble with the law and everything. And then when it comes to Josh, it's like, this storyline to me just really felt so incomplete because you never knew where it was really going to go and you knew Josh was never going to be a lesbian or even bi for that reason. And at first you think she's kind of, but she just likes men too much. All in all, it's one of the weaker storylines. And I do wonder how the LGBT feels about this because Josh was never truly in it for like the long haul and everything. Maybe she was bi curious or something, but it just kind of blew up in like, you know, her face. And then there's the whole Alex thing thinking she can change somebody, which people don't like that angle. You know what I'm saying? And so other than that, Josh was a very uninteresting character until you get into season two when she does the unthinkable. And of course, they made her into the new lead when Alyssa Milano's character left. Oh, one thing I left out about Josh and Alex. What started their relationship is when Josh kissed her first without asking for permission because they was at a party and Alex didn't want to get hit on by her friends. And so Josh pretended like she was a new lover only to piss Alex off. And then that's what caused Alex to later, you know, go in the shower and stuff with her. Next is April and she's played by Rochelle and I'm going to butcher her last name. Eights. I believe and she was the one from the original Lifetime mistresses, uh, mistresses show. I hate saying that where I get tongue tied. <laughs> and so she was the original one. And so they brought her back over for the ABC one. And I got all the girls. She is the goody goody two shoes of the group. Her backstory is that she was married to a man named Paul. Paul died and left her to raise her daughter, Lucy. It's been about four years or so. And since he's been like, you know, dead, she got his insurance money and started up her own business. Um, she sells something. I know she sells beds and blankets and other kind of things. And so like she has no dating life whatsoever. And she's only been with Paul all her life. That was her high school sweetheart. And that's the only man she ever slept with. And so, but like I said before, out of all the other characters, she is the goody goody two shoes out of the one uh, who really doesn't do anything bad until towards the end. And so her daughter, Lucy, is a very nice, polite girl, but Lucy has a bit of a bad streak to the point where she's always skipping school for some dumb reason. She, this is so funny because they, they really went Disney Channel. <laughs> <laughs> like Selena Gomez was supposedly um, a couple of miles away in like a different city or something like that. So her and her friend skipped school to go to Selena's concert where Selena hugged and kissed her and stuff like that. They were really trying to like, you know, amp up the Disney Channel like fandom in case any of them, <laughs> any of their parents might have been watching some. And so, you know, ABC owns Disney or Disney owns ABC and stuff like that. And so like... Other than that, Lucy's a pretty good little girl, but you know, she's always skipping school to do this and do that. April, well, it's interesting because she starts to find this one dude who she's kind of interested in, but things are always coming up where she always has to postpone. But he's trying to stick uh, with it with the long haul, especially since his daughter is friends with Lucy. Well, all of a sudden, a woman shows up by the name of Miranda and Miranda informs her that I had an affair with your husband, Paul, back in the day. And so this is just like baffling to that of April because she couldn't believe her husband had an affair. And it gets even worse when it turns out that he fostered another child a little boy who's around a couple of years younger than that of Lucy. April is mortified and for good reason. She thought she had this picture perfect like relationship and family only to find out her husband stepped out. And so Miranda is greedy and money hungry. She wants money bad. She wants that inheritance money from the insurance company. 
And so, like, she even goes to the point of hiring an actor to play, like, a lawyer. To tell him out, like, you know, you have to give Miranda some of, like, the money because, you know, of the child and the child's name Scotty and stuff like that. And so, April is livid and she hates Miranda because Miranda is ruining her life. April literally just paid off, like, the, um, the original owner to, like, get that shop. And now she has to, like, you know, take that money uh, or, or no, she has to go back and start working with the original owner just to make, like, even and stuff like that for all the money she has to give Miranda. And, you know, and Miranda is also interfering with her dating life and stuff. And so, like, you know, things get a million times worse when she tries to date this guy and she realizes something. It's another knock at her door. It's her dead husband, Paul. Paul originally faked his death. <laughs> but the reason why he faked his death was really stupid. <laughs> Basically, he was happy in a relationship. He just wanted to have an affair. And so he wanted to be with Miranda more. So he faked his death to be with Miranda and Scotty, leaving Lucy in April. This, of course, pisses off like, you know, April. And he's staying in town because he wants to see his daughter. But more importantly, he wants his former wife back. Turns out when it comes to Miranda, when he found out that she was going to try to get money from April, that's when he decided to come um, clean and everything. And he's been staying with Miranda the entire time. So Miranda knew that, like, you know, um, Paul was alive and everything. So basically, April ain't giving her nothing. But what makes matter worse is that, like, you know, Paul and April's new boyfriend are like fighting and this and that. And then you start to see April start to take the side of her husband. She misses her husband and everything, but it gets worse. It's to the point where she cheats on her boyfriend by kissing her ex-husband. And that's really the only bad thing she's ever done in the entirety of this series and stuff. And it's to the point where she is literally thinking about taking him back her former husband, which is just insane and crazy because the man not only faked his death that he didn't want to be with her, but he had an affair and fostered another child and everything. So what in the world is she thinking? I don't know why the writers wrote that. She was literally the most innocent person in the entirety of the show and they wrote that crap for her. And so like... Yeah, that's basically her story and, <laughs> and everything. And But then it's like, you know, because she was starting to be an interesting character. She was a good two-shoes. She's only slept with one guy. When she decided to sleep with somebody else, she did it in her shop, on the bed. And she had to change the blankets and stuff. Cause of course, she had to try to sell the bed. <laughs> but then they wrote that stupid story. And the whole point of him Faking his death is just so he can be with somebody else. That was the dumbest, like, soap opera thing I could even, like, hear. But by season two, uh, they changed it up a bit better to where Paul got himself in some trouble with the mob and everything. And so, yeah. Then there is Savannah. AKA Savvy. So she is played by Alyssa Milano. And she is technically kind of like your main character of the series and the one with the most star power that most people recognize and stuff. Ironically, I don't believe in the British version she was the main character. I believe it was the Karen character. But anyways, her character is just like scandalous, man. <laughs> I mean, scandalous. So she's married to Harry, played by Brett Tucker, the very same Brett Tucker from the Saddle Club. And so, like, he owns his own restaurant called Savannah, named after her. He's like Australian, he's a really good chef. And so for the most part, he's an all around good guy. But just like in the first episode, he has a temper. Now, at first he was supposed to play an American with an American accent, but they decided to let him use his native tongue. I am so glad because I hate when they make people change their native tongue for like American shows and stuff. 
And so him and her have been having problems in their marriage because he wants a kid, but his sperm isn't working and stuff. So it causes problems in the first episode where it makes him a very cranky, rude, mean little man at times. But other than that, he's just perfectly okay and stuff. And so like, during the very first episode, all of a sudden, Savannah has, an, uh, well, she starts flirting with her business partner named Dom. And Dom, he is played by Jason Winston George. And so Dominic, they start kind of like flirting because like, I think like, well, I forget what it's called. It's not like a, it's kind of like a G string kind of stocking type thing. The strap was like showing and he took notice of that. Just like, you know, kind of like a guy would and everything. And so like she covered herself up, but then when they was in the office alone, he asked to see it again and she showed him. Then that led to those two having a one time only affair. And since then, they've never done it again because she realized, you know, oh crap, like what the heck did I do? I just cheated on my husband. I'm no better than my mother. Cause I already told you that one filler episode tried to make her look like a good person um, by showing why her mother is the way um, both her and her sister are. And so she's always had to be the big sister to Josh and everything. Cause Jocelyn um, is just so wild and crazy. And her and Harry live in a very beautiful home, right? Like, it's just like amazing. Well, here comes the problems now with her that makes her a pretty bad character. Even though her and Dom have never done it again, there is tension between them at work. She tells him it was a huge mistake and it should never happen and never will happen again. He turns out to be a, a bad character talking about like, he wants to pursue her like again, knowing that she's married and he doesn't care. What makes it worse is that when you think she's done with him, she gets jealous when he's talking to like his secretary, who's very attractive to the point where she makes the secretary go halfway downtown just to deliver some papers. She's playing like the jealous, like lover and everything, which makes no sense. Cause she literally said it's a mistake and she wants her husband. Clearly she has eyes for Dom and stuff. And she wants to have fun with him, which is kind of weird when you watch the rest of her character throughout like the show and stuff. It's kind of like what would possess her to want to cheat on her husband other than and then she starts having dreams about Dominic and stuff. Those two like doing it and everything like that. Well, things get even more spicier when it turns out she is pregnant and she won't tell nobody but she was able to go to this lab that can literally determine the father of the baby while the baby is still in the womb and so she does that but she doesn't look at the results eventually everybody in the group finds out she's pregnant you know, in due time her sister being the last one and so she's pointing off to harry like oh you know she never knew she was pregnant and this and that. But of course, there's a problem because she don't know who the baby daddy is and stuff like that. And so she realized it probably can't be Harry's because of his bad sperm. So it must be Dominic and stuff because the fool didn't use a condom. <laughs> and so like at some point harry will find out that her and dominic did it because she confesses to him because she feels guilty everybody else is telling her to keep her mouth shut but of course she feels guilty and stuff and so when he finds out he's pissed and of course he punches dominic because dominic's trying to play oh hey man how you doing <laughs> And since then, Savannah has been trying to like make her marriage work, but Harry is kind of distant. He kind of does and he kind of doesn't. And it's at the point where he's just moves out and everything and leaves her. But whenever Savvy needs help with stuff, he'll come by and fix it. And I think she needed help with the shower. And then so like, Next thing you know, he catches her hanging out with Dom. So he is pretty much just fed up at this point. And so with the test results and she not knowing who it is, 
she gives him the um, Joss and everything. And Joss um, won't look at him because, you know, she's all like, I'm going to keep him with you. But the problem is, Harry's trying to find out and the lab won't tell him. So when he's at Josh's place and like, you know, um, she goes into like another room, he looks at the results and his attitude towards her in the rest of the season pretty much shows, you know, what's going on and he doesn't want to be with her no more. So at some point, all the girls going to have like a spa day and while at the spa with Joss and everything, so um, Savvy gets kind of that motherly like feeling and stuff like that, right? Oh, so before I get into that, also things between her and Dom are kind of crazy because Savannah, like I said before, she is trying to work on her marriage to the point of she's going to leave her law firm and everything. And, you know, she's going to like try to find another job someplace else in law. But the problem is she was trying to um, be partner at the one she works at now. And so was Dom. So this causes a little tension between those two. But then when he finds out she's about to leave, he gets kind of like upset about that and stuff. And then she tells him why. So he wants to be the father of like the baby and everything if it's his. And she doesn't want that because she just wants Harry and tells Harry, you know, you can be like the stepdad or whatever uh, or, or adoptive father. And, you know, it's even at the point, like I said before, Harry was willing to do that, but then he finds out those results. So at the spa, she starts seeing a mother and a child hanging out and she wants to know the results. So she rushes back home and is then she gets into a huge car crash. Now, somebody delivered flowers to her place, but she don't know who it was. It wasn't Dom and it wasn't Harry. And I don't think they ever reveal who it was. And if they do, it's the second season. So this is one of our cliffhangers. She's in the hospital. All the group is there except for Karen. And then she wakes up and she's fine only to talk to Harry. And he drops the news while she's on like, you know, the medical bed that the baby's not mine and I'm leaving and stuff. So at some point in time, she goes, I guess, into like cardiac arrest or something like that. And, you know, then everybody's like worried. They have to like operate on her and then it ends on a cliffhanger. And so it's like, does she survive or does she doesn't? Well, I already said <laughs> she left at the end of the second season. So she survives and everything. But everything that happens to her in the second season and what she decides to do and who she decides to date is just like mind boggling and stuff. This is when the second season really wanted to up the ante. And so that leaves us with Karen, the most traumatic character in this entire series, not just season one, but series. My God, the stuff that happens to Karen is just like insane. So she is played by, and I'm probably going to butcher her name, Yoonjin Kim. And like, I believe in the British version, I believe her character is the actual main like character. But for the American one, they made Savvy the main one because people know Alyssa Milano, but nobody knew none of the other women. And so Karen goes through all kinds of emotions, boy. Like the stuff that she did was just nuts. So she is a therapist and don't call her a counselor or nothing because she takes offense to that. But she is a, a therapist and everything. And so she has this one patient named Thomas Gray, or at least she did. He is now deceased and everything. See, Thomas was a man who was physically ill. He had a really bad illness that was taking his life. And so he was also going having problems with his marriage. And so he asked her to prescribe medication for him so that he could end his own life. Her being a therapist, she did that for some bizarre reason. She got a bunch of like, you know, medical slips and put her sitting chair on it and all kind of crap like that, right? And the question is, why would she 
do something like that? Well, it turns out that she was having an affair with him. He's married to a woman named Elizabeth and Elizabeth and Thomas and Karen are all good friends and stuff. So she had an affair with one of her friend's husbands, which makes her just like terrible, right? So you know it started to show he's dead and he's played by a disgraced actor who i cannot stand no more and he's just scum <laughs> anyways so she is upset because the wife is now like investigating his murder and stuff right so it's gonna get you know um so they're going to like investigate and it's going to like somehow it's going to get back to that of Karen and Karen is worried. What even worse is that Savvy's law firm is taking um, Karen, not Karen, um, but Elizabeth's case. So Elizabeth and Thomas had a son named Sam and Sam is distraught. You know what I'm saying? He's a college boy. He's sad. His dad's dead and stuff like that. But he has a crush on Karen. The crush becomes so intense that he's always popping in and out of her life, wanting to hang out with her, even to the point of stalking her. Yes. And he starts to become jealous when she he sees her around other men. So Karen is like upset because you know her lover is dead, and, and you see you see flashbacks of them like cooking and other kind of stuff, you know, and then she's also upset because she could probably go to jail for prescribing medication when she had no business doing and such a lethal dose and everything. So with Sam stalking her and everything and Elizabeth, um, and crap, Karen is starting to cover her tracks. So like, you know, she's trying to delete all of like, you know, Thomas's files and this and that. And she remembered that she was at his place one time. I think she left something. So she snuck back into Thomas's place because she has like the key or code or something like that. But then she ends up leaving her sunglasses there. Sam is staying at his dad's place. So he doesn't want to be around his mom. And so like Sam finds the sunglasses and he thinks they're his mom's and he gives them to her. Well, she says it's not hers, and he realized, that, oh, dad must have had an affair, but he does not know it was Karen. <laughs> so, at some point in time, um, her and Sam end up kissing, but then she realizes it's wrong, and she tells him just to leave her alone and all this other crap. But remember, he is stalking her. So, at some point, the, like, the, the story gets very convoluted and crazy. Elizabeth later goes on to Karen and tells her, I'm dropping the suit. And something about you giving the medicine and blah, 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 something like that. So, she wants Karen to literally forge a confession saying that you know tom was like depressed um depressed and everything and he has suicidal thoughts and all this other crap karen doesn't want to do it but then somehow elizabeth kind of blackmails her into doing it so now um with that literally written and given to like you know a judge and stuff like that it gets even more crazier so at some point in time it turns out that um elizabeth knew and she knew all along that thomas was having an affair with karen she's been playing them the entire time like she didn't know nothing and she's trying to open up an investigation into karen now um and so like so now karen's like doubly screwed and everything or triple or a quadruple at this point. And so um Karen literally confesses um what is it? While like, you know, in court. Not so much court, but it was like in a room with lawyers and like a judge or whatever. Because somebody hired her a really good attorney. It was Sam of all people. And Sam's all like, I'll be your alibi, you know, so you won't you won't have to like, you know, um even though he's gonna lie and stuff because she was never with him but he's he's gonna be her alibi when they get to the little makeshift court thing it turns out he's now his mom's alibi with shots and surprises her why did he turn on karen right so karen just confesses she's all like he came to me he wanted to end his life and i did it 
And so somehow the case got completely dropped. I forget how, and Karen's in the clear. Then the story gets even crazier because it turns out that Elizabeth used to be in the crazy house and everything. And so like nobody knew she was crazy. So this makes Karen think, wait, hold up. If Tom was too sick to give himself the medicine, who gave it to him exactly? Well, one day when the girls are at the spa and everything and Karen's supposed to show up, here comes Elizabeth with a gun. <laughs> and she makes Karen stay in the home. And so it turns out that it was Elizabeth who murdered her husband by injecting him with that medication because she found out that Thomas and Karen had an affair and that he loved Karen. And so she just went nuts and wanted to kill him and everything. So Sam at some point, you know, he goes to his home about the league because he's pissed at his mom. And because um, his mom made him lie to be her alibi. But he realizes the family gun is missing. So he drives over to Karen's, busts open the window, and, you know, it's, um, Elizabeth like confesses to everything. And so, you know, there's the gun and they're struggling. And so at some point off camera, you hear like a gunshot, right? And you don't know who got shot and who possibly died. Cause it ended in like a cliffhanger. And so like, but with Karen, she lost her job because her and her partner who funded that, um, therapy type place, at some point, it looked like they were getting kind of romantic at one point, but not really. And then he told her, you know, after your confession and all this investigation in this, once this is over with, you need to find another job. He like straight up fired her and everything because she broke her ethnic code by having an affair with this married man who's her patient, prescribing him drugs and so he can like off himself and stuff then he finds out about the whole sam thing and he just realized that, you know karen's just too much work and he just can't deal with it and stuff but like i said before that gunshot went off and it ended on a cliffhanger it this show was determined to come back so they left us with two major juicy cliffhangers and everything of two people possibly dying and so i already told you about savannah but it's like you know kim and everything um karen but you know i already told you karen throughout the entirety of the show um went through the ringer so yes karen does survive but who got shot though was it sam or was it sam's mother and stuff and then we find out in the beginning of like season two so all in all this was a good show it was a great desperate housewife filler that really filled that void of people longing to see like these women going through some of the craziest cattiest stuff ever and it lasted for four seasons, but it just sucks that the last two just kind of went like nutty and everything with um, the newer characters and, you know, Alyssa leaving. And it's a shame that this show has never been put on DVD for people to enjoy, but you can find it on Hulu. Happy Women's History Month, everybody. All right. Well, I'll talk to you later. Bye.